why would someone even care about changing the schedule if it's if it's this generic scheduler that just works well enough like what sort of improvements would someone want to make to that to better suit their workflow so well yeah so if you're talking about like the average person that's just using linux well, sure. um, yeah, you probably definitely not yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, they're, they're yeah, they're probably they're probably going to going to be just fine with the EVDF for the default. But there's a few different types of users, I would say. So, um, so I'll give you an example from Meta. So we in, with HHVM, and if I'm going too deep into like the the crazy weeds, just let me know. Um, but with uh, before with you move HH, on, HHVM, yeah, what sure. is that one? Uh, Hip Hop VM. So that's the that's the PHP JIT engine that we use at Meta to run our web workloads. Um, if you laugh when I said PHP, that's totally fair. But this is um, this is a new type of PHP that's statically typed um, and has like tons of optimiza optimizations for jitting. So it's actually really fast mm -hmm. now. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things about JIT engines and compilers as well, actually, is that they have really, really bad instruction cache locality, mm -hmm. which means that they're not really doing the same code a lot in like a row. They're going to this branch and this branch, and then they're compiling this code over here. Um, especially with JIT engines. And so they have really, really poor front end CPU locality is the term for that. Um, and that means that they also have really poor IPC, which stands for instructions per cycle. And so a lot of the time when you're writing system software code, you want to try to use the CPU as efficiently as possible so that it can pipeline things and do a bunch of things at the same time. But with something like a JIT engine, it's really hard to do that because it's just it's just not really possible if you're like, if you're if you're basically having to decode instructions every time you're doing something. So in such a scenario, um, something like CFS, which is quite sticky, because again, it's used to kind of it was built in a time when you had um, when you had uh, cores that were further apart and it was more expensive to migrate. It doesn't really lend itself very well to that philosophy of stickiness because um, you actually just want to throw that thing onto a CPU and just just let it go. Like you want to be able to run this thing as fast as possible. Maybe keeping it on the same CPU for cache locality like might be okay, but if you have a CPU and you're waiting around, then you should just throw it over there. So um, that's a, I sent a patch set for that actually upstream that hasn't been merged yet, but that's an example of like where we want to make the scheduler more work conserving is the term for that. So it's it's a, it's just doing it's 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 erring on the side of doing more work as opposed to kind of improving locality or these kinds of things. Um, right. And there's I mean there's so many things like <laughs> we have we have a ton of SCEDEX schedulers already that are all that are all cute and eclectic in their own ways. Um, and I can certainly give you really interesting examples if you're if you're interested in more. Yeah, if you have some, before we get like deep into what SCEDEX is specifically, if you want to give those examples, we can do that. Sure. Yeah. So here's another one. So, um, so VMs are interesting. Like if, if you're talking about a VM, the way that the scheduler views a VM is by uh, what are called vCPUs or so virtual CPUs. And so in the guest operating system, you have obviously whatever threads have spawned in this guest OS, but from the perspective of the host, the, the threads of the VM are just its actual CPUs that are running, which, which kind of makes sense if you think about it, right? Because you're, um, the, the guest OS has CPUs, it's scheduling stuff on those CPUs, but it's the actual host OS that decides when those CPUs get to run, right? It's multiplexing the, C, the, the physical CPUs to these virtual ones. Um, and that's fine if you're working on like an overcommitted environment, which is obviously not uncommon at all for VMs. But for a lot of workloads like on AWS or on, on a lot of cloud providers, you can imagine that it actually might be better to give us a vCPU, uh, uh, an actual physical core, and just turn off timer interrupts. Basically, do everything you can so that you never interrupt the guest at all. Um, it's a little, it's pretty expensive to exit the guest. It's called a VM exit, and it's there's hardware is doing a lot of stuff. It's it's not cheap to do, so you want to try to avoid that. So, um, you could, for example, build a scheduler where all scheduling decisions are made from a single core, mm -hmm. where you're not running a, a, a guest vCPU. And you just let the vCPUs burn on the core. You're not no timer interrupts, nothing that would pull it out of the uh, the guest. And um, if you need to actually do a reschedule, you're like oh something needs to run there. There's like a K thread, a kernel thread that needs to do some I/O or something like that. Then you can send what's called an IPI, inner processor interrupt. And there's a specific one called a reschat IPI. It's designed for making it do a reschat. And you send it from the one core that's actually doing the scheduling and kind of organizing everybody. And um, that works, right? Because you don't really need to do very many scheduling decisions in real time, like you would with a normal scheduler. And you also you kind of take the scheduler and the host out of the way of the guest. And you can actually have really big speed ups in cloud environments by doing that. So when you're dealing with these, like dealing with schedule, uh, when you when you're at the point of dealing with scheduler problems, you're sort of at this point where you've 
optimize the code and you've got this giant deployment is like okay how do i further optimize it from here like how do i get the absolute most out of the hardware i have you probably wouldn't approach the problem anywhere before that point yeah so yeah um <laughs> That's funny you should ask that because before I was doing this kind of work, I kind of was like, what is left to do? Like, um, what, for example, something I hear a lot from people is like, oh, kernel compile is like optimized completely. There's nothing left to do for kernel compile, which is untrue. You can, we could do better for kernel compile, believe it or not. Um, and so how do you go about fixing or improving something that's been like banged on repeatedly and relentlessly for so long? Well, the good news is um, hardware is extremely, extremely complex, which which gives people like us a job. Um, and so, to give you an example, earlier I was a, uh, I was talking about the front end CPU pipeline and how uh, how that is sort of really slow when you're doing like a JIT engine, JIT workload. Well, to go into a little bit more detail to kind of make that make sense, one of the parts on Intel CPUs, at least one of the parts of that is called the um, the uh, the DSB, the decode stream buffer, mm -hmm. which takes instructions like x86 instructions and will will uh, compile those into into a microcode into like risk instructions, which are actually what run in the back end of the CPU. Mm -hmm. And it'll cache those so that um, it doesn't have to do that decode every time. And that's one of the things that thrashes a lot if you're doing a JIT engine. But um, that thing, this decode stream buffer, if you look at the Intel CPU for like the Skylake microarchitecture, it's like, okay, if you have three, it's actually like this well specified or like this no logic specified. If you have like three unconditional branches within a 32 byte window, then like you always, you always have to use a new entry in the DSB. And there's all these like really particular hardware specific things that have nothing to do really with the workload. And um, there are times where like you might pad out your code by like a little bit and then you get this huge like 10x speed up on your on your program. So that kind of thing, you know, is is always there's huge, I think, I mean, a lot of the time there's huge gains to be made from that. Um, now, talking about the scheduler specifically. Uh, so we've talked about sort of like hardware hardware related stuff but there's also a lot of software related things that we don't really take into account now with cfs mm -hmm. or evdf but in the future and i'll talk about this more when we get to skedex but um you can imagine if you have like a service where you have one thread doing a lot of io that's reading an rpc message or remote procedure call message so i got a request you know like you want you want like a cat photo i'm going to take your message demarshal it into something that i can run on the server and then pass it off to like a worker thread to actually do the work well, you probably want to put the worker thread on the same core as the IO thread because the IO thread just pulled the whole message into cache, right? So it's hardware related still, obviously, because it's still talking about caches, but it's um, it's really kind of, you have to understand the application. It's more of like a, it's it's you're kind of getting a little bit higher level than the kernel even at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, to, I'll stop monologuing in a second. Um, but, you know, in general, when I'm just going in to, um, to attack a problem, I'll usually first look at IPC instructions per cycle, which is kind of a good metric of how well are you using the the, the, the core, mm -hmm. um, and then I'll start to look at like what else is kind of going right. If it's lower than I expect, all right, it, like like where are we stalling? Are we stalling in memory loads? Is like I/O the bottleneck? Are we just compute bound? We just need more cores, um, and you know, you it's it's sort of a process of elimination from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So, one thing you did touch on earlier in there that I want to get back to is it sounds like when you're dealing with these scheduler problems, it's going to be very platform specific. Like if you are dealing with like a Skylake CPU, if the architecture changes a bit with the next generation, you might want to restructure how that scheduler is uh, being used to better suit that specific platform you've moved to. Yep. That's right. So a lot of it is compiler stuff, like compiler level. Like um, there, are, there are a lot of bugs you'll see, like with with LVM or with GCC, where it's like, like I was saying, oh, if we pad this out a little bit more and we emit the code, it's much better performance on this micro micro architecture or that one. But it's absolutely also a scheduling problem, and um, a good example of that would be AMD. I would say um, on uh, one of the earlier Zen microarchitectures, you had what's called an AMD ROM. Um, and the AMD Rome um, had a very different latency uh, distribution for accessing memory outside of your L3 cache compared to the next generation, which is called Milan. And now the modern generation is called Bergamo and things are just getting huge and huger and huger. Um, so 
you know, with all of these things, like for what I was saying about like aligning text and that kind of thing, that's really more of a compiler problem. But, mm -hmm. um, but the point is, right, like all of these little things, there, there's so many details like that in, um, in, a, in, in a CPU. And, um, you know, you have to just like every part of the system kind of has to play, but the scheduler is scheduler is a really, really big part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. for something like, like these big Bergamo machines and AMD that have like hundreds of cores and stuff like that. Mm -hmm.